I was going to ask somebody to remind me, but we're going to we're going to do it now. There we go. Okay. So, um, preparing to be an instrument in the the hands of the Holy Ghost, or to be preparing to be an instrument for the Holy Ghost, uh, is a powerful principle. Um, Elder, like I said, like we were talking about before I hit record, Elder Bednar uh, 11 years ago shared a discussion with seminary teachers and he taught principles that will, that help us to become instruments in the hands of the Lord. And um, it, let me just share one experience I had. I've, I am still practicing to do this well. I'm still in learning mode. And for you that that are new, you might, I don't want you to get discouraged because that's what we just all are trying to, to, to do our very best. But if you'll try to practice the principles that I'm going to share with you from Elder Bednar today, you will be an instrument in the hands of the Lord and you will, you will be, you'll be directed to, to, to guide your students when they need it most. We, you'll be able to minister in this, these principles allow you as a teacher to minister one-on-one -on -one with each student as you as you seek the Holy Ghost to teach them. So let me um, let me share the experience and then I'm going to share the first clip from Elder Bednar's discussion. Again, I think I have the whole discussion as well as the text to it, but I'm only going to share a few few clips. Um, when well, I'm going to share the first clip, and then I'm going to share the story uh, about. So here's Elder Bednar, and he's 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 preparing. He's talking to new teachers as well as seasoned teachers, and um, he starts off by talking about Peter jumping out of a boat and walking on water, and how do we do that? And 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 he talks about how exercising faith in the in the Savior, and that teaching is very much like that. Uh, is to 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 jump out of the boat, and it's it's scary. I'm sure for Peter to jump out of the boat and try to walk on water with the Savior um, was exhilarating, but also pretty pretty scary. And um, and then he talks about Joseph Smith and how Joseph Smith learned for himself. And uh, let me share my screen really quick with you. Okay, hold on. Okay. Okay, here he is. Can you all make sure that you give me a thumbs up so you can, if you, if you can hear it. Joseph's statement, I had learned for myself. May I simply suggest that simple scriptural phrase is something that should be embedded in each of our minds and hearts. Teaching is not talking and telling. Teaching is observing and listening so that we can discern and then know what to say. I, I commend the courage of Brother Webb today when he talked about teaching an institute class and a student posed a question or made a comment and he was rather preoccupied with his lesson plan. Now, I'm not picking on Brother Webb because he introduced the example. He was more concerned about talking and telling than he was about observing and listening so he could then discern and know what to say. May I suggest that if we go into a classroom pretty well confident we know what to say, you're totally unprepared. Now, that doesn't mean you just walk in and you're clueless but you have to jump out of the boat. Now, let me explain what I mean by jumping out of the boat. I don't think personally Peter knew he could walk on the water sitting in the boat. It wasn't until the Savior beckoned him. He had his gaze fixed on the Savior 
and then he went to the Savior. And I suspect he may have even been a little surprised to find himself walking on the water, but he didn't know it sitting in the boat. So for you and for me as religious educators, you and I have to jump out of the boat and you and I have to fix our gaze on the Savior. And as we go, and yes, we have prepared, and yes, we have treasured up, but in the moment, it will be given us that very portion that is needful. That can be a little scary. And if you're not willing to jump out of the boat, then there cannot come an increased portion of the Holy Ghost, not to help you, but to bless the students so they may learn for themselves. All right. Let's see. All right. What what stood out to you from that two and two and a half minute clip from Elder Bednar? I think the thing that it reminded me of is that when I I have fairly big font when I make my notes, it's like 14 point. And if it is long, if my lesson plan is longer than three to five pages. I haven't left room for discussion and for the spirit and to answer questions. If I've got more than five pages, I have too much material. I have to hone it and edit it and edit it until I get to what they really, what we really need to talk about. And even then they're going to tell me what we need to talk about. Yeah. Good, good point. You know, and, and he gave an, ex he gave an example of Chad Webb being so focused on his lesson plan that he wasn't focused on the students. And uh, I just, I want you to know, I, I've been there. Sometimes I'm so worried about teaching lessons that I don't focus on the students and, and I'm focused on the lesson outline and I don't listen. And it, I, I'm not prepared to be an instrument in the, ha the hands of the Holy Ghost. I'm just regurgitate, regurgitating a lesson plan. Uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you, um, Julie. Who else, what else did you, what else stood out to you? Yes, Sister Word, will you unmute and then share? What I really liked uh, what he said is um, it's more important to observe uh, than and listen than to be up there talking as um, the, the students will dictate what the spirit wants you to say. Yeah. With our message and we have all the facts in a row and we're gonna spit them out. Um, that's when you hear it. Yeah, that's so important. That, that's, what, that's what's changed my teaching when I, when he said that teaching is not talking or telling and, and you're like, well, what is it? And then he's, and then when he started saying teaching is observing and listening. So if I'm up there talking and telling I'm the talking head, there's, too, I see that too much with seminary teachers. There's too much talking in classes. Um, but if I'm talking and telling that there's no time for me to observe and listen and then discern so that I know what to say next. So the more I have them taking part, and I'm going to share what he said, some ways that we can do that. He's, he shares some things that are really powerful. But the more that we can discern, we can observe and listen and then discern, then what happens is we, the Holy Ghost shares with us what we're to say next. And from your preparation or from your reading, I, I find it happens so often that things that I've been reading the last two weeks or whatever will be the things that they need and, uh, or a story might come to my mind or whatever. And, uh, but uh, then we can, then we can minister one-on-one -on -one with, with some students. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to share this story, but then we're going to come back to what you've found from that, that clip uh, from Elder Bednar. Um, so I was trying to do this. I was trying to practice this because I'd never really heard, you know, you hear there are scriptures that, that this, this observing, listening and discerning, then knowing what to say are, is based on. And we've had probably, all of us have had probably experiences 
a little bit with that in our teaching before, but I was really trying to, to do that in my class. And I remember we were, I don't remember what book we were in. And I know that we were in a lesson and I had my well-devised, I had my flight plan already, you know, and, uh, and a couple of students made some comments. And, and as I was listening, as I was observing those comments and listening and discerning, the Holy Ghost took us on a tangent that, that I, we started to talk about um, death. I had some experiences with three of my students in Montpelier, Idaho. They were killed in a car accident. And then there was another student that, that died. And then my dad died all within a month of each other. And we, I started talking about what I'd learned from death from those experiences. And, uh, and then when the lesson was over, I beat myself up a little bit because I thought oh, I did not cover the material that I was supposed to cover. And uh, I just kind of went away feeling like I was a failure that particular lesson. And I thought, okay, I'll try next, I'll do better next time. But um, the very next morning, I received a call from one of my students and he said, my grandmother just died last night. And the things that we talked about in class were, a, and some of them are pretty personal, and were a very, were a great blessing to me and helped me through some, and he described some very sacred details of what he had experienced. And uh, it was a, it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful blessing to be a instrument into the in the hands of the lord at that moment thinking i was a failure but i actually was just observing listening and discerning and then i knew what to say next and and those things were important for one student especially in my class so anything else from elder bednars um from his statement I don't have anything in particular from his statement, but as we've been discussing, I have thought about my lesson preparation and realized that when I would pray before I began lesson prep and my prayer would specifically include, what do they need to know? And that's what I would petition the Lord for. What do they need to know? I found, and I would tell my students that I prayed about that and that I helped them see my revelatory process and helping them learn that those lessons were the ones that went the best every time. Wow. Yeah. Cause it's, it's that same principle, isn't it, Megan, that, uh, that we're, we're trying to be instruments in the hands of the Lord and that we're not just talking and telling, but we're observing, listening, and then discerning so that we know what to say next. Which starts before the lesson. Yeah. It, I'll just, you know what, and probably all of you can speak to this too, but there have been so many times when I prepared a lesson, I've been teaching for 30, about 30 something years. And, um, and there've been many times when I just knew that one of my students needed this particular quote or this particular object lesson or this particular, this, this or that or the other. Sometimes I even knew which one. Not always, but I just, there was just, you know, in your preparation when I, th I think that's really important, Megan. I, you guys have all taught seminary. I haven't been in seminary, but something that stood out to me, and I'm sure I'm probably just saying what you all know, was the fact that Peter didn't know he could walk on the water sitting in the boat. And what, what I really took from that was, um, and after listening to President Uchtdorf, you know, Sunday, and then re-listening to his fireside again, um, so many times we just do what we've always done instead of implementing the actual system that these apostles are telling us to implement and, and what you're telling us to do, you know, go in and be prepared, but, but uh, listen and observe as part of our preparation piece to know what to say. And um, I think that's, that's stepping out of the boat, letting go of the comfort zone of what we've always done. You know that I, Leah, that you're not the only one. There's a number of very new teachers that are here that, that you'd only been teaching one or two years. That's, 
that's a, to me, that's a new teacher. I didn't figure it out for five years, but I know you're a lot quicker than I, I am. So you'll figure it out in a year. So, but um, Leah, I appreciate that um, insight that, that jumping, I, I'm going to invite you all to, to get out of the boat this year. Don't, don't just focus and don't just, don't just rely on that lesson plan. If you, if you do that, then you're not going to be that instrument. But if you can, you can put together, like Elder Bednar says, that he, he says, I don't want you to be clueless. I don't want you to be not prepared, but you go in prepared and then, and then you listen and you, you get out of the boat. We, remember what he said about how Peter got out. How is Peter able to walk on the water for a time? Hey. From Elder Bednar. Because he kept his focus on the Savior. And that's what that's what President Uchtdorf was saying over and over and over in that fireside. He was fixed on the Savior. His eyes were fixed on the Savior. And uh, as you do that, and you practice, you'll just get a little bit better and a little bit better, and you can be instruments in the hands of the Lord. But if you're so, again, I watched, I watched teachers that are worried and stressed about teaching seminary that they don't try to get out of the boat. They just, they just hold on to the lesson outline and their, le their lesson plan. And, um, and we're going to talk in toward the end of our discussion, we're going to talk about some ways to, to get out of the boat and allow our students to do a lot of the di discussing and sharing and testifying, which allows us more time to observe and listen and discern so that we can know what to say next. But it's very difficult to do that when you're like going from one thing to another to a, from another and you're and you're not allowing your students to to share and if you've um most of your coordinators talked about if you're a teacher longer than a year they talked about scripture feasting last year that's one of the best ways for you to get out of the boat and get out of the way so that they can they can be teach and that's one of the best ways to just sit and observe and listen and discern so that you know what to say next so Let's go with the next clip um, from Elder Bednar. And I think this is where he talks about getting out of the way as teachers. Oh, can I mention something? Yes, please. Um, because as you were looking at this as, in a sense, as we the teachers emulating Peter. Uh, and I was kind of looking at it in, in the sense of the student as Peter, as, you know, we as teachers, uh, as we share this, message with them uh we get them out of shell, shell so that they can experience you yeah. know the thing just as the savior trying to get i mean i i i I'm guarantee peter never supposed that he could walk on water and you know when jesus was telling him, hey come out of here he, you know it was a new experience that, hey i can do the same thing the savior and that's you know as, as we as teachers trying to get them you can all these things that we're teaching you, you can experience it yourself. I think that's so important, Dane, because even Elder Bednar talked about that. We want them to learn for themselves. And so not only will we be jumping out of the boat and fixing our stare or our, our, our gaze on the Savior, but we will we'll invite our students to do the same with us so that we can, and I, I even teach, I teach my students the same principle, Dane, that, that if you're in a, if you're with this class and we're discussing something and as you are, as you as a student are observing, listening, and you feel like you need to say something, please do that because that's, that's generally the Holy Ghost share having he wants you to share what you have, what, what's in your mind or what's the what thoughts that you just had. Because, because whatever you're about to share will bless the life of somebody else in this class. That's how, that's how the gospel works. That's how the Holy Ghost works. And they could be or as much or more of a blessing to their fellow students than we are as we're listening, observing, listening, and discerning. So I would teach, the, I would teach my students the same principle so that they're more apt to, to get out, jump out of the boat and share um, what the Holy Ghost wants them to share they're going to have experiences that will be more meaningful. Yes. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to go to a, the next clip from Elder Bednar. Let me see. Joseph's statement. I had learned. Got to get out of there. There we go. Hold on. 
So were you, you're all able to hear that okay? Okay, now this is weird. Okay. Elder Bednar um, asks, I want you to listen for what Elder Bednar asks us other as, as well. He, he says, tells us to get out of the, get out of the way, but listen for some other principles. I don't know where this question is from, but the question is, how do we get the students to jump out of the boat with us and experience the water on their own? It's a magnificent question. To the teachers, I would say, get out of the way. Now, you saw the perfect illustration of this today. You had a master teacher describe something he had done that taught him powerful truth. And he didn't tell you what he learned. He invited you to go do the same thing and get it for yourself. Can you see that pattern in what he did? What would most teachers do? Well, let me show you what I got. And we got PowerPoints and here's the list and we give you a handout. Now, I'm not saying that you never do that. Please don't go to extremes. I just think we have gone to extremes in providing so much stuff and so many handouts that people don't have to learn for themselves, but they can't learn it from you and they can't borrow what you have learned for yourself. So I would just simply pose this question. How do I invite these young people to learn for themselves? I'll give you just an illustration or two. One of the powerful doctrines I find in the Book of Mormon relates to the strengthening and enabling power of the Savior's atonement. He not only cleanses us from sin, but he strengthens us, blesses us with capacity to do hard things that in our own strength and with our own limited mortal capacity, we could never do. Now, once you have explained that much, if someone is not familiar with that strengthening, enabling power of the atonement, they have a hunger and a thirst for more. And there's danger in giving them too much. So what I often do is try to get just enough so they can begin to taste. And then I'll extend this invitation. Get a brand new paperback copy of the Book of Mormon. Don't use your scriptures. They're all marked up. Inexpensive copy of the Book of Mormon. And you read from the very beginning to the end. And you look for every instance you can find of this type of language. The Lord strengthened us. We were victorious in the strength of the Lord, in the strength of the Lord in all of the variations. Now you find those in the whole Book of Mormon. There are hundreds of them. And don't you dare do a keyword search with a computer. You turn the pages and you look for them and you mark them up. When you get all done, you take that copy of the Book of Mormon and you extract those things out and you figure out how to do that. You just do it your own way. Pull those things out and then look at them, compare them. And then when you get all done with that, you just write a one page summary of what you learn doing that. Now, can I tell you, I, I do that all over the world and I do that with young people. If I have a young person who asks me a question and the question goes in that direction, I'll bring them up and I give to them one of my business cards. And I will say, now, if you do this, I'm not putting the heat on you, but if you do this, would you just send me a copy of your one page summary? I'm not going to correct it. I'm not going to publish it. I just would be interested in seeing what you learn as you do that. All right. Um, what are your thoughts? What, what did you What did you learn from that clip? That Dane is right on target, right? <laughs> I think one of the things that I have learned just from experience, um, 
and a lot of these training classes is not to ask questions that are tell me what I'm thinking. Instead to ask questions, you know, you can you can set up a premise with, well, you know, what is the scripture saying? But to ask open ended questions about how does that make you feel? What is your experience with this? Um, that puts it on them to tell me about themselves. But that's a very scary place for a teacher, especially a new teacher to be, because it requires confidence that the spirit is going to be at work in the room. So true. So true. One thing that I thought of when he was talking, especially about the, um, that how, you know, looking through the Book of Mormon for, um, for times that the savior strengthens and um you know for those examples and this is something that that at the beginning of this year i told our kids i'm like okay we're going to go through this and, and just like the prophet has asked us to do we're going to look for the blessings to pro to covenant israel and then i found that you know and i feel like our discussions are pretty good and from time to time we would make those lists on the on the board and things like that but it, it didn't happen as consistently as i wanted it to but i think that 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 topic would be an ideal topic to take his his example of you know what he tells people to do with the book of mormon we can take that same thing going into this next semester and saying okay in this in this block of scripture or in this this uh you know topic that we're working on look for the the breast the blessings of of Co to covenant israel and instead of me telling them did you notice this did you notice this have them notice it and then tell it back to me and then say what does that look like in your life you know this is what the, this blessing looked like in their lives what is this what might this look like in your life so important heidi that to, to uh, both you and um both Heidi and Julie, your comments, uh, your both of your comments allow us to sit back and listen. Right? We can be, with if we do what Heidi and Julie just taught us to do, we'll be able to observe, we'll be able to listen and discern after they've shared what they've experienced with covenants of the Lord or what or what have you, and then you'll know where to go next. So, so brother beasley to kind of build upon that we might also consider instead of telling us telling them what to look for ask them each to look for what they feel like they need to look for and then they're each going to share what they themselves are looking for and then they learn for themselves so the other, exactly. the other thing because that elder bednar is trying to get us to do yeah what what in what in this what in you, you might give them three verses and say what in these three verses most speaks to your heart? Or, I mean, there's so many ways to ask that, what you just said, Anne, that- uh, but why, I think it even goes, we, we did this at the beginning of, of the year. We asked our youth what they wanted to get out of studying the Old Testament. And then we, we as teachers kind of remembered what those were. And when we would do that, we'd, we'd come across something that applied to that. We would say, okay, you see how that actually applies to your question. And so- you know, it's something we could ask often, but I think we also want them to be looking for that outside of the class as they come back in and share, as opposed to us telling them, look in these scriptures. They may say, I looked in these scriptures and this is what I found. That's that's exceptional. Thank you, Anne. I love that comment of all your comments. Heidi, Julianne, appreciate it. Any other thoughts or comments about what we've what we've been discussing, what Elder Bednar's taught us? If I can make another comment, I think. In, along the lines of confidence in the spirit doing its job is confidence in the scriptures to be able to speak for themselves. We don't have to interpret that for the kids. They can read them and let the spirit work on them and receive witness on their own. We don't have to tell them what it says. Yeah, we have to trust the scriptures and we have to trust that this, our students, that they're capable of learning on their own and the more we the more we trust both the the greater tool will be in the hands of the lord to sharing what we need to that the holy you know will be greater tools you know the title of our 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 um discussion today thank you julie any other comments
All right, you want another clip? Another clip. Let's see what we got here. This is such a this was a fantastic. Okay, what's that? What's that then? Okay, let's go with let's do this one. My second part of the question is, having spoken to a former student of yours, they said you were very successful in getting students applications. Macy, try. That's a great question, and I want to try to not just prescribe applications that may work for me, but wouldn't necessarily work for you. I guess if I could try to state a principle and then give an example. If you invite them in. And sometimes in teaching in the church, we don't invite people in. We push them away. I was in a gospel doctrine class the other day, and the teacher was asking, oh, what are the, these three? He was talking about the oath of covenant of the priesthood, and he talked about, he was asking for something. And, um, and, and people were getting it wrong according to him they were getting it wrong and then it just it just shut down the entire class because he would say wrong that's this or wrong it's that and so this is exactly what elder Bernard. what did he say sometimes we don't invite them in and uh listen to the rest we of push it. them away playing a game called guess what's in my head julie didn't you mention that everybody know this game <laughs> it's a dumb game and if i could be so bold it's my observation that the holy ghost is rarely there when you're playing guess what's in my head guess what's in my head is there are three basic elements in the baptismal covenant and then you nail somebody sister dalton stand up and tell us the three elements of the baptismal covenant well sister dalton knows that until she's called on by a member of the quorum of the 12 in a worldwide broadcast <laughs> At which point she can't remember her name. <laughs> so we put people on the spot and then we coach them. Oh, now, come on, Sister Dalton, we know you can do this. Yeah, ratchet up the heat on her. <laughs> and then the inexperienced teacher poses the question again 16 different ways. And now the poor student is totally befuddled thinking, okay, I, I messed up the first question. So now I got a whole bunch of other ones and I'm kind of panicked here and I can't remember any of them so we just blow them away if you ask a student if you read a verse and you simply pose a question that invites them in what stands up you might want to write these three questions down because you could use it for any block of scripture what he what kind of his again he just throws things out the scripture feasting does the very same thing that we've been talking about. If you don't know what scripture feasting is, talk to your coordinator about it. Um, but I'm going to back up a little bit again, just to, to again, you might want to write down these questions because they're just powerful ways to, to invite students in and allow you to observe, listen, and discern so you know what to say next. In. What stands out to you in this verse? What do you learn from this verse? As you think about this verse, are there things that you think it would influence in how you do things day to day? Those are just three examples. But there's no right or wrong answer. You're not just throwing it wide open. You're trying to find out where that student is in terms of what do you think about this verse? It's also along the lines of what Ann taught that, uh, you know, sometimes we just need to we need to find out what they want to learn, what they they think about things, and uh, and again allows them to and what Dane talked about with uh, learning for themselves and having them jump out of the boat, and uh, you know we're um, just it's just again this is just a powerful example of a principle that we can employ in our seminary teaching that allows us to get out of the boat, or what stands out to you. And as you're listening and observing and discerning while that student is talking, the Holy Ghost is helping you know where to go next. The other thing is, I just think sometimes, without being dogmatic or rigid, we don't expect enough of these young people. 
And I think it's not unrealistic. It is not unreasonable to say you have as much responsibility for the success of all of our learning in this classroom as I do. In fact, you have more. Now, I will come prepared every day to help make this a great learning experience so you can learn for yourself. But you've got to do the same thing. In your way, you help them understand that and hold them to it. And you don't beat them up. You don't pound them. But you just let them know that that's the expectation. And if they come, my students, when I was teaching a religion class, I didn't lecture to them. I didn't come in and say, here are the three things you need to know about what President Harold B. Lee taught in this message. They can get that on their own. They really are the young people that have been reserved for these latter days. Well, let's quit telling them that and start treating them like that and expecting them to come through. And if we do, and we don't keep bailing them out, that's why I said teachers have to get out of the way. It'll be a little awkward. It'll be a little painful. But the awkwardness and the pain teaches them that you're not kidding about they got to come through. I just believe they will over time. Help me know if that's responding to your question. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your thoughts about that clip? My thoughts say something. Um, I, one thing I've learned this this last year is how much the, the youth really do understand the gospel. I mean, they understand and they know what the what their duty is. And uh, and as I work with them, they have shown, they have taught me a lot of times in, in some of these lessons uh, uh, from, from their experiences. And um, I really, I totally agree with him that we just get out of the way and, and let, the, let, let them learn from, their, from the experiences. We're just there to guide them. That's all. Thank you, Dan. I'm so glad you're on today. That you shared those couple of really important principles for us. I, I love it. Thank you. Anybody, anybody else? It's it's actually easier to teach that way to to have them. It's it's and it's wonderful to hear your your students, um, share what they think about the scriptures to, and and give them more chance and opportunity. And there's just one thing you need to do. You just need to give them time to think and formulate they sometimes we don't wait long enough we might ask a question or we might point them to the scriptures and we don't wait long enough for them to formulate what they want to, to say and if you'll just wait and be patient with that that they they will make incredible comments and 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 be there brother beasley but i you know i just a word of caution i think we all need to be mindful of uh not allowing a comment to derail the rest of the class and mm -hmm. so making sure that that we also follow the spirit and if something's going off track uh finding the right way to pull it back on track and oftentimes uh you have to do that in such a way that you don't you don't shut that student down going forward but that you do it in such a way that they know they still they still are the contributions are important but there are some contributions that aren't meant for the discussion yeah, that's a real skill. Thank you, Ann, for sharing that. That's, they do <laughs> appreciate that um, principle. Anybody else? Brother and sisters, I'm grateful to be with you. I testify that as you practice, again, I've been practicing these things for 10 years and I'm not that, I'm getting better at it, that I, I just invite you to practice what Elder Bednar has taught and getting out of the way and allowing your students to do a lot of the talking and, and then observing, listening and discerning so you know what to say next. I testify that, you know, I know with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ. I know that this is his church. I know that Joseph Smith saw the father and the son in that grove of tree, trees in New York. I know that the Book of Mormon is the word of God. I love the Old and New Testament. So grateful for the Doctrine and Covenants, for to be able to hear the voice of the Lord in his first person. I just love that. I testify that um, I know that you new teachers can do this and you can get out of the boat. You fix your, fix your gaze on the Savior 
and he'll teach you. There will be times when you, think you might feel like you're drowning and you just say, Heavenly Father, help me not to drown. <laughs> help me to teach me to teach because I know you know how I don't know what I'm doing here. But Isaiah's <laughs> coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially Isaiah. <laughs> uh, good point. Thank you. Anyway, I, I'm so grateful that you take some time and I went longer than I wanted to, but uh, appreciate you jumping on to be with us to, today. And uh, I, I'm grateful for you. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. You have a, you have a great afternoon. Um, my wife